morning. Welcome to worship. We hope that you had a fantastic 4th of July. We're your church family. We're here for you. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you. And we're so thankful for the opportunity to worship with you this morning. Let's go to God and enjoy his presence. worship the king and sometimes it feels easy to praise him collectively but we've been apart physically and so we turn our trust we turn our hope to him because it's only through our hope in Jesus that we have a peace to face every day so in this song we invite you in to not just sing it but to make it your prayer and to know that your God is with you now
are all I need, all I need. I am forever in love with you. We lift your name high this morning. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for your great love, Lord. Teach us to trust. Teach us to grow. Teach us to thirst more for you. In your name, amen. My life is built on your faithfulness. My hope is held in your promises. I take each step with your confidence, for I am yours. I am yours.
Good morning. We are so glad that you've decided to join us for worship this morning from wherever you are. To join us in song, in prayer, and to hear the word. Here's a few reminders for this morning. Stay connected today by filling out that online connect card. If you don't see a link to it at the top of your screen, hop on our app or on the website at stpaulumc.org and fill one out. We love to read your comments and pray for you during the week, so please use that Connect card. We also want to remind you to take a look at our building reopening plan. It's online, on our app, and on Facebook. If you're ready and able to serve when we reopen the doors, please let us know by emailing us at church at stpaulumc.org. If you're not ready to serve or ready to re-enter the buildings, that's okay. Our children's ministry director is here to let us know what the kids are learning about this month. Miss Katie? Hey Treehouse Kids and welcome to July. Even though it's a new month, we aren't starting a new series. We're going to continue to talk about faith with our elementary school students. This week we're focusing on knowing that Jesus is a gift for everyone. And for our preschoolers, we're learning about the story where Jesus loved Peter even after Peter denied him. And Jesus will always love you too. If you want to hear more about that story, you can go online to our social media accounts and check it out. It's pretty awesome. But until then, I hope you are doing well. We are praying for you and we hope to see you soon. Bye guys. Well, good morning. It is just so terrific to watch our ministry directors of student ministry and children's ministry continue to find new ways to connect with our children and keep them in God's word. As Miss Katie just mentioned, it's a new month. It's the beginning of July, and we're so accustomed to celebrating the 4th of July in big ways. But this year, it's been a little more subdued without all the fireworks and all of the things that we're used to. So we hope that this morning, as your family continues to celebrate a weekend that's important to our country, that you will use this time to draw close to the Lord. I'm Pam Dubo. I'm the executive pastor here at St. Paul, and I'm glad you're joining us today as we begin a new series about necessities. You know, the things that we have and that we do for our community, the necessities that we provide, are made possible because of your generosity, just as are the ministries that Miss Katie was just talking about. We're so appreciative for those of you who have continued to give generously to support the work we're doing in the world, in our community, and through online worship. We realize we'd much rather be here together, but until we can, we thank you for your support, and we remind you that we continue to receive your gifts, checks that are mailed to the office, online giving, or giving through our app. And if you happen to be joining us this morning as a visitor, we want you to know that we have no expectation at all that you'll give to this church. But we hope that during this time of pandemic, if your church is not able to broadcast or be online, that you'll continue to support the staff and the pastors of wherever you happen to worship normally until you can return to live worship in, per in person. And so now let's take a moment to uh, offer a prayer of thanksgiving over the gifts that we will receive this week and for the celebration that we enjoy this weekend as we remember our country's independence. Let us pray. Loving God, this is a weekend that our country celebrates so many things, but this year the celebration is a little different. We know there are many among us who are sick, who are facing trials brought about by loss of jobs. We know that we have folks who are worried about loved ones who live across the country and who they can't visit. And so today, as we offer this blessing over gifts that we will give you, we ask that you bless our nation, that you bring us to, through this time of difficulty, this time of trial. Help us be better than we've ever been before. Help us work hard as a church to live into the promise that we've always had, that life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness are supposed to be for all people. Let us lead in that as we heal all that ails our land. God bless these gifts and the givers. Let them become the tools that we use to do ministry here in our community, 
as we care for the people that you have entrusted to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we are starting a new message series this morning, and it's called Necessities. This series was born, I believe, because um, God spoke to me in a, in a way during the last three months while we've been apart, and it has asked me to reanalyze my own life to determine if all the things I really think are important truly are. We've all had time to be home. Some of us are going crazy at home with loved ones that we'd like to get away from for a few minutes. And some of us are home alone and we long to see people. But in all of those situations, God is using this time, if we open our hearts and our minds to his leading, to teach us something new about what's really important. You know, Jesus, our Savior, knew what was important. He spoke about things that mattered. And if you look in your Bible and you have a red letter Bible, you can read in his words Many words about life's necessity. He knew that people needed to be healthy. He knew, to, he knew that they needed things to eat and to drink. And he spoke of these things in a parable that he instructed the people with toward the end of his ministry. It was a parable about judgment day, about the separation of sheep and goats. And Jesus was reminding people that their faith in him counts it's ultimately the most important thing. But if that faith that we have and we share isn't manifested in our care for our neighbor, then it's a very shallow faith. And so I'd like to share a few words from this parable this morning as, as a guiding scripture for this entire Necessities sermon series. It comes from Matthew chapter 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Jesus identifies several necessities in that text, things that are important for us to have and to share with others. He mentions food and drink or water. He mentions having a place to live, having companionship, having visitors, having people who care for us when we're sick. He mentions all these things in the context of our physical needs. And as we watch the devastating things that... Um, COVID-19 does to people's ability to breathe, I would add to that the necessity for air for us to breathe. Because indeed, right now we have lots of people whose illness are based on the fact that they can't get that good clean air into their lungs. But Jesus does much more in his ministry than teach about the things our bodies need. He teaches about the things that our spirits need. He teaches about the things that our souls need to thrive in addition to the things we need to keep our bodies healthy. So as we go through this series, we're going to look at all of these necessities in light of that physical need and the spiritual need. And today, we'll begin with the necessity that Jesus spoke up first when he said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And of course, that necessity is food. Food is one of our basic needs. We can live for a while without food, weeks, months, but eventually our bodies need to be nourished. The Bible is replete with stories of a culture that was built around food. Many people worked as farmers or herdsmen. They gathered, they planted. It was an agrarian society. We can go back to the creation story and we read how God created plants to be food for people. And later in Genesis, we read about the brother Joseph, who had been betrayed by his older brothers, who actually saved his whole family during a famine by providing food for them. 
one of the beautiful passages that are remembered in the Exodus story is when the people were hungry and grumbled and cried out to God that God provided manna from heaven to feed them. So the Bible is filled with stories about people's need for food. Some of them are miraculous stories. There's a story of a, a widow who has a son and she's down to her last bit of flour and oil and the prophet Elisha comes to her and asks her to bake bread and she shares what little she has left and miraculously during a time of famine God continues to replenish her flour jar and her oil jar. You know, Jesus' parables, so many of them, symbolize things that we need using the elements of food. He tells the parable of the wheat and the weeds or the sower and the seeds. We read of his miracles feeding thousands with a few loaves and a few fish. He called some of his disciples from being fishermen and told them they would become fishers of men instead. And of course, we should never forget that post-resurrection meal he had on the shore when he restored Peter. So the Bible is just filled with things that remind us, stories that tell us that food matters, but there's always a double meaning. Most of us live lives where we don't have to worry about where our next meal will come from. But early in this pandemic, when we first had things shut down, some of us went to the grocery stores for the first time in our lives and found certain shelves of food empty. Canned fruit, canned vegetables, soups, meats, eggs, and milk were rushing off the shelves as people began to worry, well, will there be enough food for us? And in that, maybe God was planting a seed in our hearts. Maybe God was reminding us that there are people who live in our country every single day who wonder if there's going to be food for them or for their families. At a time when food pantries closed and the grocery uh, stores were a little bit bare, we just began to get an understanding of how folks who are hungry every day might live. You know, Jesus said in that parable, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And it's interesting because I had this message mostly finished and then I read a Facebook post. I read it from a friend of mine, a clergywoman, who had just finished reading a book called I Was Hungry. The title was taken from the very verse that I have read to you this morning. The interesting thing, if you can see the book cover on your, um, on your screen, you'll see that the words I was hungry are crossed through. And that's because the author of this book, Jeremy Everett, has made it his life's mission as a minister to eradicate hunger in America. The fact that the words, I was hungry, are crossed through, demonstrate to us his aspiration, his goal, that America would become a place where no one ever had to be hungry at all. That's an important goal here at St. Paul. We operate open arms, our food pantry, and Yvette Carter tells me we're getting more and more people who are coming there now to get food during this time where people don't have enough to eat. This book describes a story about two little boys that a pastor found one day as he pulled into his church. It was a Saturday morning. He was getting ready to prepare a breakfast in the kitchen for the elders of the church. And he saw two little sets of legs dangling out of the church's dumpster as his headlights swept across the parking lot. And he and his son, who was with him, caught up with these two little boys who tried to run away. They thought they were in trouble, but they weren't. And they told him that on Saturday morning and Sunday mornings, they often came to the church's dumpster to look for food because the only time they got to eat during the week was when they were in school, and on the weekends, there was no food. Not only did that story inspire the author of this book to make eliminating hungry his goal, but that story and stories like it 
are what cause us to engage in a ministry called Pack-A-Sack, where on Friday afternoons, children who leave Largo Middle School go home with a sack of food that we've prepared for them so they'll have something to eat over the weekend. It's your generosity and your gifts that make that and our other feeding ministries thrive here at St. Paul. It's one of the things we do best. And this year, our Florida Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church has made a goal, an ambitious goal, that our United Methodist Churches across the state will provide three million meals for families in Florida that are struggling to have food on their table. It's a goal that we've always been part of fulfilling. And we will continue to do that and keep you posted on how our conference is doing meeting that goal. So yes, Jesus understood that we needed food for our bodies. And he told us that we would be separated among the righteous if we saw hungry people and gave them food to eat. But he also knew that there was a kind of food that was a lot more important than physical food. And I'd like to read to you now from John's Gospel. But to set the stage, the the story I'm about to tell you, the scripture I'm about to read, is in the Gospel on the day after Jesus, is, Jesus feeds the multitude on one side of the Sea of Galilee. That night, his disciples cross over, he crosses over with them, and in the morning, the people that he left behind are looking for him, and they can't find him, but they went around the lake, around the Sea of Galilee, and found them. And this is what Jesus said to them when they asked why he left and how he had gotten across the sea. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, You have seen me, and still you do not believe. There's a a couple of remarkable things about that passage. If you're familiar with the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, the feeding of the people during the Exodus trip through the wilderness with manna is very central to their understanding that they're provided for. And in Jesus telling them that the food comes down from heaven and that he is the bread of life. He's essentially telling them that he is divine. He is of God. And this did not make everyone happy. But what really struck me about this passage is that the people who were there listening to him had been in the area of Capernaum where he was. They had seen him heal the sick, cast out demons from those who were demon-possessed, They partook of a meal where he took a few loaves and fed 5,000, and they had the audacity to ask him for a sign. I mean, John uses the word sign as we might use the word miracle. I mean, how many miracles does it take for people then and now to believe that God provides all that we need? People remembered the manna from heaven But they were kind of crediting Moses with it, and Jesus corrects them and says, No, that is food from God, that is bread, that is life-giving, 
and I am the bread of life. Jesus is pointing to a different kind of food, food for our souls. But there's something else that's important about this. If we read on in Matthew, at the very end, we know that Jesus says, go make disciples of all the nations. He intends for people to do that by sharing the good news, by being in service and being servants to others. And that's one one of the important things about this message today. People, Jesus feeds, people eat, and their bodies are nourished, as with the loaves and the fishes. Jesus teaches, people hear, and their spirits are nourished. But it doesn't end there. What discipleship means for us is that we take the kind of food we eat and we share the abundance of food we have with others. That we take the word of God that Jesus teaches us in the scriptures and we share it with others. You see, disciples have a role in providing both the spiritual and the physical necessities of life to people who don't have those necessities, either physical or spiritual. The cycle repeats itself, and as we invite more people into the fold of claiming Jesus Christ as their Savior, there's even more disciples to go out and feed the hungry who are spiritually hungry or physically hungry. You know, sometimes when people leave a church or go to another church, they say things like, well, I wasn't being fed. Sometimes what they mean is, I don't like the music style. Sometimes what they mean is, I don't like the way things have been moved around in our worship space. Sometimes what they mean is, the pastor's too conservative or the pastor's too liberal and I don't agree with what's preached. But sometimes the reason people leave a church is because they want to be fed without being asked to grow as disciples and to feed others. Every now and then, not very often here at St. Paul, but every now and then I'll hear someone say, I've done that for years. It's someone else's turn. I'm retired. Let the young people do it. Or I'll hear young people say, I'm still working full time and I'm raising children. The retirees don't have anything to do. Let the retirees do it. But the fact is, discipleship is for all of us. And an important part of discipleship is feeding, both spiritually and literally, by doing things so that people in our community are not hungry. You know, COVID-19 has helped us learn some important lessons. But just before it fell upon us, as it has, we had a message series about our values as a church. And one of those values was the value of generosity. And it reads like this. We believe generosity is the heart of God. We get to give. And as I have mentioned before, we get to give can be read two ways. First, we get, we receive things so that we can give some of that away but it also could be read as we get to give. We get to be a disciple. We're permitted to be in ministry with God. And how awesome is that? That's the beautiful thing about generosity. Generosity with God allows us to be receivers and givers. First, we are recipients. We learn. Our spirits are nourished. We grow in faith. And then suddenly we become the people who are passing on the faith to others. As we'll learn throughout this series, that's true of many of life's necessities. We have these necessities, both the spiritual and the physical, so that we can pass them on. And as we talk about these different things that are so important in our lives over the next few weeks, I hope you'll always spend a few moments thinking about this necessity is something that I receive so I can pass it on. This is its physical part, and this is its spiritual part. I hope you'll focus on how we as a church can offer these necessity to others. Now, it's no accident that we began today with the necessity of food, because in a few minutes we're going to share a very holy meal. 
Today's a special day because it's Communion Sunday. And I know that we have been celebrating communion in a way that seems a little foreign or different to us, but I've heard from many people that it's also been very meaningful to feel God's presence in their homes as they sit with family or loved ones and listen to the liturgy online and then share in the meal. It's a celebration, though, that brings together physical food, bread and juice, with spiritual food. They often teach us in seminary that these signs, these elements, are outward signs of the inward grace that we receive from God when we celebrate the sacrament. So as you eat the bread today and as you drink juice, remember, you are taking Jesus into your heart. You're being nourished spiritually for a purpose that's bigger than yourself. We're called to extend this hospitality to the world, to other people. This isn't our table, it's the Lord's. And so let us pray together this morning as we prepare our hearts to share that necessity we call food, the kind that nourishes our bodies and nourishes our souls. Let's pray. Loving and eternal God, in the days and weeks ahead, continue to teach us about what really matters in this life. Help us to grow as disciples and to become people who share each and every day of the spiritual food that we receive and through our ministries here at St. Paul of the physical food of which we have such an abundance. Help us always to be wise and to recognize that all necessities of life come from you and that you will always provide everything we need it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we gather at the table, and we come with a central purpose of taking an object lesson, something that was physical, that Jesus then interpreted and made spiritual. Physical food for spiritual development and, and spiritual nourishment. So before we do that, let us understand that Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Therefore, let us draw near and offer our humble confession. I want to encourage you to join me in a prayer of confession this morning. Why do we pray a prayer of confession before Holy Communion? Because we want our heart to be right. This is a spiritual act. It's a transformation of receiving the grace of God, the real presence of Jesus in the room, in us through the physical elements of bread and the cup, which is filled with juice. So let me just invite you to um, maybe close your eyes if you want. And, and I always encourage people to, to just lift your hands to heaven and, and um, uh, just think about what it means to pray a prayer of confession what it means to give your life to Christ, what it means to be a holy people. And now if you'll follow with me on the screen, we'll pray the prayer of confession together. Let us pray. Pray out loud with me. We do not come to your table with clean hands or clean hearts. We confess that we cling to worldly ways and resist changing what is necessary if we're to become more like you. Help us to cooperate with your spirit within us as we seek the renewal of our minds and spirits and church. It is in your name we pray. Amen. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, something physical, gave it to his disciples, but then he first of all said, break this. And he said, this is my body which is going to be given for you. Take and eat now and do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink all of this. For this is my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it as often as you are together in remembrance of me. And so God, I offer this prayer today with these objects of bread and juice in the cup, these physical things, I pray that they become the spiritual food that we need. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and juice and make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we who are one body continue to remain as one in Christ until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. If you're new to celebrating communion, let me just share with you that this is a sacrament in our church. We have blessed it, we have consecrated it, which means I have consecrated the elements that you have in your home as well. We believe God is not contained in a room, but we know that we, when we invoke it, the, the spirit that is the spirit impresses upon us that God is here. So we believe this to be the presence of Jesus, that Jesus, once we consume it, is with us, his grace is in us, and it yearns our hearts to continue to be his disciple. So I encourage you to take the bread, take the bread as a remembrance and eat it. And now take the cup, the blood of Christ, and drink it. You've now received this holy sacrament. May God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, for the mystery of our faith that we confess today through the receiving of these elements of bread and of juice, we thank you that we are one in Christ, one in ministry to all the world, and one in ministry together with all the saints. In Jesus' name, amen. Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today. Faithful you have been and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me. And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. On my Angels and saints, we sing words. 
receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord provide every necessity of your life. And may the Lord grant you the wisdom and the grace to know the difference between necessities and wants. Go in peace. Be safe in the week ahead to love and serve the Lord. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.